All right, this is video lecture number nine. <clears throat> Again, this is Mr. Weber, Festus High School. Welcome. Uh, today we are going to talk about the politics of empire, uh, spanning the years from 1660 to 1713. Four sections today. Uh, we're going to look at imperial expansion and aristocratic power, from mercantilism to imperial dominion, the glorious revolution in England and America, so you'll get a little review from world history there, uh, and finally, imperial wars and native peoples. So let's begin. Um, by 1660, England had established a series of colonies in America, but they did not have a system in place for controlling them. Over the next quarter century, the Stuarts would tighten their control economically and politically. Uh, a generous and extravagant man, uh, Charles II, rewarded his supporters with millions of acres of land by creating proprietorships in New York, uh, New Jersey, the Carolinas, and Pennsylvania. For example, eight noble supporters of King Charles were granted an extensive tract of land between Virginia and Spanish Florida that they later named Carolina, after the Latin form Carolus of the king's name. Uh, except for the requirement that the colonies conform broadly to the laws of England, the, these proprietors could do as they pleased within their vast domains. Although the king doled out land liberally to pay his political and financial debts, um, he kept tight control over colonial trade, which was an important source of royal revenue. Following a pattern established by the Navigation Act of 1651, <clears throat> Charles II and several English governments enacted a series of measures designed to confer on England the full benefit of colonial trade while excluding the Dutch. Uh, the new mercantilism constituted a successful trade policy, uh, but the Stuart monarchs then went a step further to establish political control. After the accession, accession of, uh, to the throne of James II in 1685, Rhode Island and Connecticut surrendered their charters. Uh, the two colonies were merged then with the Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth colonies to form a new royal province, which was called the Dominion of New England. New York and New Jersey were added in 1688, creating a political unit that extended from Maine to the Hudson River. The Dominion represented a new kind of authoritarian administration that attacked local institutions by abolishing legislative assemblies and town meetings, uh, by levying arbitrary taxes, and challenging land titles under the original charters. The Glorious Revolution of 1688 in England triggered a series of insurrections then in the colonies. Uh, local differences, including ethnic rivalry in New York and uh, Protestant Catholic conflicts in Maryland, uh, influenced the causes and outcomes. But everywhere, the rebellions marked a turning point in the history of the colonies. <clears throat> they ended authoritarian rule and brought both a new era of political stability uh, and imperial presence uh, limited mainly to the supervision of colonial trade. So let's dive into this a little deeper and start with our first section, which is imperial expansion and aristocratic power. Charles II gave the Carolinas to his friends uh, and gave the Dutch colony of New Netherland to his brother James, the Duke of York. Uh, James took possession of New Netherland and changed its name to New York. The proprietors of the, these new colonies sought to create a traditional social order uh, with a gentry class and an established Church of England. The fundamental constitutions of Carolina in 1669 uh, prescribed a manorial system with nobility and serfs that were governed by a small number of powerful nobles. Poor families in North Carolina refused to work on these large manors and instead chose to live on modest farms. South Carolinians imposed their own design of government uh, and they went on to attack Indian settlements uh, to acquire slaves to trade. South Carolina remained an, an ill-governed and violence-ridden frontier settlement all the way until the 1720s. Pennsylvania, uh, designed as a refuge for Quakers, persecuted in England, 
developed a pacifistic policy towards the Native Americans and they became prosperous. Uh, Quakers believed that people were imbued by God with an inner light uh, of grace and understanding that opened salvation to everybody. Penn's frame of government in 1681 guaranteed religious freedom for all Christians uh, and allowed all property-owning men to vote and hold office. Uh, ethnic diversity, pacifism, and freedom of conscience made Pennsylvania the most open and democratic of the Restoration colonies. From mercantilism to imperial dominion then, on to the next section. In the 1650s, the English government imposed mercantilism uh, via the Navigation Acts, which regulated colonial commerce and manufacturing. The Revenue Act of 1673 imposed a plantation duty on sugar and tobacco exports uh, and created a staff of customs officials to enforce the mercantilist laws. In commercial wars uh, between 1652 and 1674, uh, the English ended Dutch supremacy in the West, uh, uh, specifically uh, with the African slave trade. Uh, the English also dominated North Atlantic commerce. Many Americans resisted the mercantilist laws as burdensome and intrusive. Uh, to enforce the laws, the Lords of Trade pursued a punitive legal strategy. In 1679, they denied the claim of Massachusetts to New Hampshire's territory. Uh, instead creating New Hampshire as a separate colony. In 1684, they annulled Massachusetts Charter. When James II succeeded to the throne, um, his insistence on the divine right of kings prompted English officials to create a centralized imperial system in America. Uh, in 1686, the Connecticut and Rhode Island colonies were then merged with those of Massachusetts Bay. Um, and Plymouth uh, to form the Dominion of New England, which was a royal province. Two years later, New York and New Jersey were then added to this Dominion. Sir Edmund Andros, who was the governor of the Dominion, was empowered to abolish existing legislative assemblies and rule by decree. Uh, Andros advocated worship in the Church of England uh, he banned town meetings and challenged uh, land titles. Okay, so let's move on then to our third section, which is the Glorious Revolution in England and America. In 1688, James's Catholic wife gave birth to a son, uh, raising the prospect of a Catholic heir to the throne. To forestall such an event, uh, Protestant parliamentary leaders carried out a, blood, a bloodless coup known as the Glorious Revolution. Mary, James's Protestant daughter, by his first wife and her husband, William of Orange, uh, were enthroned. Queen Mary II and William III agreed to rule as constitutional monarchs who were loyal to uh, the Protestant Reformed religion, and they accepted a Bill of Rights that limited royal prerogatives and increased personal liberties um, and parliamentary powers. Parliamentary leaders then relied on John Locke's two treatises on government from 1690 uh, to justify their coup. Locke rejected divine right theories of monarchical rule. Uh, Locke's celebration of individual rights and representative government had a lasting influence here in America. The Glorious Revolution sparked colonial rebellions against royal governments uh, in Massachusetts, Maryland, and in New York. In 1689, Andros, uh, the governor, was shipped back to New England, uh, and the new monarchs broke up the, I'm sorry, he was shipped back to England, uh, and the new monarchs broke up the dominion of New England. Uh, the monarchs did not restore Puritan-dominated government. Instead, they created a new royal colony of Massachusetts, whose new charter granted religious freedom to members of the Church of England uh, and gave the vote to all male property owners uh, instead of just Puritans only. The uprising in Maryland uh, had both political and religious causes. Uh, Protestants 
resented rising taxes and high fees imposed by wealthy, primarily Catholic, uh, proprietary officials. In New York, the rebellion against the Dominion of New England uh, began a decade of violent political conflict. The uprisings in Boston and New York toppled the authoritarian Dominion of New England uh, and won the restoration of internal self-government. In England, this, uh, the new constitutional monarchs promoted an empire based on commerce. Parliament created a new Board of Trade in 1696 uh, to supervise the American settlements, but it had very little success. Um, the overall result was a period of lax administration. Okay, so the final section is Imperial Wars and Native Peoples. Between 1689 and 1815, Britain and France fought wars for the dominance of Western Europe. As the wars spread to the Americas, they involved a number of Native American warriors armed with European weapons. The War of Spanish Succession from 1702 to 1713 uh, pitted Britain against France and Spain and prompted English settlers in the Carolinas to attack Spanish Florida. So that they might help to protect their English settlement, whites in the Carolinas armed the Creek peoples uh, to fend off French and Spanish attacks. The Creeks took this opportunity uh, to become the dominant tribe in that region. Native Americans also played a central role in fighting in the Northeast. Um, aided by the French, the Abenakis, and the Mohawks took revenge on the Puritans, uh, attacking settlements in Maine and in Massachusetts. New Englanders responded to this by joining British forces in attacks on French strongholds in Nova Scotia and in Quebec. The New York frontier remained quiet uh, because of the fur trade and of the Iroquois policy of aggressive neutrality, uh, trading with the British and the French but refusing to fight for either side. Britain used victories in Europe to win territorial and commercial concessions in the Americas in the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713. Um, Britain obtained Newfoundland, Acadia, and the Hudson Bay region of northern Canada from France uh, and also access to the, West, uh, the Western Indian trade. The treaty solidified Britain's supremacy and brought peace to North America for the time being. Okay, this concludes today's video lecture. So at this time, please answer the review questions in your notes and move on to the reading.